it is now my great pleasure to introduce to you Nikki Baldwin, Tyler Gonzalez, and Shar Norris. We are really honored to have you here today to learn from you. And I know it will be just as amazing as it always is. So thank you, ladies, and welcome. Thank you, Dina. <clears throat> Thanks for being here with us, everybody. I see some um, friendly faces. I saw some faces for a minute there. And uh, it's good to see names of people that we know well that you're here with us. It's feels good to be presenting among friends. Um, yeah, I'd like to just introduce us a little bit. Um, my name is Nikki Baldwin, and I am at the University of Wyoming. <clears throat> I, I direct the Wyoming Early Childhood Outreach Network. And um, that's a network that's one of the initiatives from the Trustees Education Initiative. And um, in addition, I'm on the Early Childhood Faculty, and I direct the Early Childhood Special Education Endorsement Program. I see some former students on here, so it's great to see your faces, well, your names. Um, and I'm also, I get to lead an organization called the Wyoming Early Childhood Professional Learning Collaborative. And that's a collaboration among multiple state agencies to provide free professional development opportunities for early childhood educators out in the state. And I'm so excited today because two of our professional learning facilitators from that organization are going to be presenting with me today. They both have expertise in universal design for learning. And so I asked them to join me and I'll just let them introduce themselves. Tell us a little bit about you, about your region um, and some of your experiences. Um, Tyler, why don't you start us off? Sure. I am Tyler Gonzalez. I am the facilitator up in the Northwest region, which includes Bighorn, Park, Washakie, and Hot Springs County. Um, I work with educators both on the program level, region-wide, and individual level, just to um, help them recognize all the awesome things they're already doing and work towards goals they might have. Um, what else did you want to say, Nikki? <laughs> no, I forgot. Anything else, uh, anything else about you? Your family, anything? You have two cute um, boys? Yeah, I have two little boys. They're four and two, so they keep us very busy and active. And um, that's what we spend most of our time doing is hanging out with them. So thanks, Tyler. Shar. Hi, I'm Shar Norris. I am the Southwest Regional Facilitator. I'm down here near Evanston. Um, I'm do I am the facilitator for Lincoln, Uinta, and Sweetwater counties. Um, I am, have four children, two girls and two boys, um, two teenage girls and two boys. <laughs> I also, um, I have taught third grade. I did that for two years in Utah till we moved here. And then I um, taught preschool and I was an education coordinator and the early head start here. So I've had some experience in the classroom. Um, I've been working with different um, educators throughout my region in both uh, book studies um, and different types of professional learning. And it's been amazing. Thanks, Char. Okay, I will share my screen here. And today our session is about universal design for the inclusive classroom. And I just wanna invite all of you, um, we'll be monitoring the chat and we would really love it if this was a more interactive um, sort of discussion as we present today. So the, the first thing I wanna warm us up with is just have everybody take a second, type in the chat. Um, if you have heard of universal design, if you have heard of universal design for learning, anything that you might know about it, we just wanna do a little pre-check and see what our audience knows about this idea, universal design. So will you just take a minute type in the chat um, if you've heard of universal design for learning or not it's great if you haven't go ahead and tell us that and then um, if you have heard about it what are some things that you know about it and Shar and Tyler will you just help me keep an eye on that Christina shared, um, oh, I'm echoing a little bit. Is that happening for you guys? Mm -mm. Uh, making high quality learning accessible for all students. 
Leslie said yes, especially in connection with the provision of accessible educational materials. Getting lots of yeses. So we had one person that wasn't as familiar. Okay. Strategies for supporting learning for all students. And that it's, it's great for classroom space materials, classroom management, technology, content instruction, and social interactions, and most important, executive functioning. Nice. Susan says, the, just said yes, the, and then she put the word inclusive. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's good to know that um, quite a few of you have, have heard about universal design, so that's exciting. Um, just to help you uh, understand what we're going to be trying to do today, we're going to spend at the Professional Learning Collaborative, the thing that we focus on is transformative learning in three ways, our dispositions, our knowledge, and our practice. And so today in this presentation, we're gonna spend some time talking about universal design and the dispositions that are required to pull that off. And we're gonna to try to add a little bit to your knowledge about that. And then we're gonna link it to practice at the end of the session. So if you wanna be listening for that, um, that's, a, that's just something you can look for. Here are our learning objectives. So we, as far as that disposition piece goes, um, we're gonna be rethinking what designing for average means. We're going to be talking about um, some things that we wanna maybe challenge about our learning and beliefs. We're going to then introduce some of the basics of universal design for learning, um, including the two key principles that guide that. We're gonna identify the three universal design for learning networks. Then we're really excited to share a new document, the Wyoming Coherent Path to Quality with you. And there's this really strong links to universal design in that document, so we'll be doing that. And then we're going to, as another application tool, we're going to talk about backward design and how that links to universal design for learning. So that's what we're going to cover today. And to just get us started, we can't, it's just impossible to present about universal design without showing this video. I can't, I've tried and I just have to show it every time. So uh, we're going to show a quick clip from this TED talk from Todd Rose. And what we just like for you guys to look for are um, what we can learn from the Air Force cockpit example what is wrong with designing for average and what we should be designing for instead. Now I have to just make sure that I didn't forget to check the right boxes when I shared my screen so that the video turns out well. Okay. Um, share this video, please stop me, jump in someone if there's any problems with the video playing. Here we go. It's 1952 and the Air Force has a problem. They've got good pilots flying better planes, but they're getting worse results, and they don't know why. And for a while, they blame the pilots, they even blame the technology, and they eventually got around to blaming the flight instructors. But it turned out that the problem was actually with the cockpit. Let me explain. Imagine you're a fighter pilot, you're operating a machine that, in some cases, can travel faster than the speed of sound, and where issues between success and failure, sometimes life and death, can be measured in split seconds. If you're a fighter pilot, you know that your performance depends fundamentally on the fit between you and your cockpit. Because after all, what good is the best technology in the world if you can't reach the critical instruments when you need them the most? But this presents a challenge for the Air Force because obviously pilots are not the same size. So the issue is, how do you design one cockpit that can fit the most individuals? For a long time, it was assumed that you could do this by designing for the average pilot. That almost seems intuitively right. If you design something that fit for the average size person, wouldn't it fit most people? It seems right, but it's actually wrong. And 60 years ago, an Air Force researcher, Gilbert Daniels, proved to the world just how wrong this really is and what it was costing us. Here's how he did it. He studied over 4,000 pilots 
And he measured them on 10 dimensions of size. And he asked a very simple question. How many of these pilots are average on all 10 dimensions? <laughs> the assumption was that most of them would be. Do you know how many really were? Zero. Gilbert Daniels proved there was no such thing as an average pilot. Instead, what he found was that every single pilot had what we call a jagged size profile, right? It means, not, it means, it means you're not, no one's at the same on every dimension. And this makes sense. Just because you're the tallest person doesn't mean you're the heaviest. It doesn't mean you have the broadest shoulders or the longest torso. But this is tricky because if every pilot has a jagged size profile and you design a cockpit on average, you've literally designed it for nobody. So the Air Force realized they had a problem and their response was bold. They banned the average meaning that moving forward, they refused to buy fighter jets where the cockpit was designed for an average-sized pilot. And instead, they demanded that the companies who built these planes design them to the edges of dimensions of size, meaning that rather than design for, say, the average height, they wanted a cockpit that could accommodate as close to the shortest pilot and the tallest pilot as the technology would allow. Now, the companies that made these planes, as you could imagine, weren't happy, right? They argued and lobbied, and they said, it's going to be impossible, or at least impossibly expensive, to build a flexible cockpit. But once they realized that the Air Force wasn't going to budge, suddenly it was possible, and it turned out it wasn't that expensive. And in fact, they made great strides leveraging simple solutions that we all take for granted in our everyday lives, like adjustable seats. And as a result, the Air Force not only improved the performance of the pilots that they already had, but they dramatically expanded their talent pool. And today, we have the most diverse pool of fighter pilots ever. But here's the thing, many of our top pilots would have never fit in a cockpit designed on average. So, most of us have never sat in the cockpit of a $150 million fighter jet, right? But we've all sat in the classroom. Okay. Just take a minute <clears throat> while I pull back up the PowerPoint and let's just have you guys all just type some thoughts, response to the video in the chat. Any, anything he said that stands out to you, we'd just like to hear your thoughts about the video. Shelly shares, there is no average. Lauren says, if you design for average, you design for no one. And I love that. Isn't it so cool how he said literally, like literally not one person fits that average. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lacey is echoing that Char, she said um, that she loved when he said if we design for some, if we design something for the average, we design it for no one. Focus on flexibility and adaptability. Mm -hmm. Christina said, "If you mark, if you you will miss the mark if you design for the idea of average." Mm -hmm. And Jenny said, "It was a great video. There isn't an average anywhere." Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, everybody. And let's do make the next step. Then let's talk about what this means with children and students. So let's just take an example of uh, this adorable girl right here and just think about where she might sit in these dimensions. 
And how that works for children, right? You already made that nice connection. The truth is that when we design our classrooms for average, the same holds true. We end up designing it for no one. And so we really wanna spend this time with you today thinking about how we can change um, how we design instruction and environments and the relationships we have in our classrooms so that we're avoiding this pitfall. And I just think this image is really powerful for us to think about because um, our current model in education is tends to be this, that the child might be this square peg. Um, the classroom requirements and expectations may be that round hole, but, and how we respond when the child might not meet those classroom requirements and expectations determines what what we're doing. And I just, I don't know about you all, but I don't want to be the hammer. Um, I want teachers to be in a different position than that. So we're gonna just talk a little bit about what universal design, this representation has been used for a lot of different things, but I like to think about it in the context of universal design. So in traditional classrooms, we tend to have this, everybody gets the same. And you can see why kids aren't successful in that. What we often do in our current special education models is we provide accommodations and individualized support strategies and we try to get kids here and I think we can often we want to pat ourselves on the back and just say congratulations we've done that I think that really positive things come for kids when we do that universal design though is intentionally transformative in that we want universal design to lead to this and how do we get there it's useful to think about where universal design, those concepts came from, and they actually came from architecture um, in public spaces. And so if you think, as I'm showing you some of these visuals about universally designed spaces um, that you've seen and how you've benefited from those. So they're just, the idea of universal design is that products, environments, community spaces should be made to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or something special for an individual. And here's an example of a universally designed shower so that you could access this if you uh, use a wheelchair, you could access this if you need to use a walker, if you don't need a wheelchair or walker, you can access this space. There's nothing special that needs to be done for an individual because the entire space is designed for everyone to be able to use it. Another example that we frequently use is a universally designed curb. Um, I really like this visual of a universally designed space. I think it's beautiful. And I hope we can hold on to this visual as we think about how we plan um, and assess children in our classrooms. And just some things that are really important to think about universal design is that it's good for everyone. Um, and all those spaces that you just saw I mean, I can even just go back to, for instance, this space. Um, any of you guys been pushing a stroller? Um, this is really helpful for you, right? So um, even if you're not a person who uses a wheelchair, even if you're not a person who's visually impaired, there's a lot of things that are really helpful about that space. And the same is true in our classrooms. But here's just a universal design um, access example. A push button door is really helpful for someone in a wheelchair. It's also helpful for a parent who has their arms full. Um, it's also really helpful for children that can't reach the door handle. In fact, it's the favorite thing for children who can't reach door handles to do. There's great power in them being able to push a button and make it happen. It's really great if you're a delivery person and you have a large delivery. So that, that um, push button door opener is a wonderful gift for everybody. Another example of universal design for learning, uh, something that seems really simple in our early childhood classrooms, a visual classroom schedule. Often we think we're creating a classroom schedule for maybe a child with a disability. We know that a child with autism, they frequently respond really well to having a visual classroom schedule. But in addition, if it's a child who's had a rough morning and they just need some reminders that their parents come in to get them, um, having that visual to represent what's happening through the course of their day can be super helpful. Also, if there's a parent that wants to know what's happening during their child's day, it's a great benefit for them to see that. If it's an English language learner, they benefit from a visual schedule. And any child that wants to know what's coming up next in their day gets that opportunity 
a guest or a teacher that's new to the classroom and wants to be helpful can also benefit from that. So universal design is an amazing tool because it benefits everybody in a space. Um, and I just think we, we want to, it's important to step back as we think about that and remember why it is we're doing what we're doing. And so I just think this is a key for all of us to remember that children's success is built upon current success. So there's this foundation um, and that might seem super obvious to this group, but just think about it in the context of the choices that we make um, for children if they might be struggling in a classroom. So we know this, we know children succeed by having success to build upon. Um, so their success now should be our most, most important goal. And so we wanna meet them where they are. We need to meet the young child where she is, not where we think she should be. So we might have a learning goal and we might have our instruction, expectations, demands for the child. But if there's a gap between our instruction, our expectations, demands on that child and where that child is, that gap right there, this is really essential to think about what's happening for a child there. That's where struggle, challenge, the potential for failure exists. And what we need to do is we need to shrink that gap, which means who needs to move? We do. Who needs to change? We do. Who needs to carry the biggest burden of figuring out how to help a child be successful? That's us and not the child. So universal design is a way to help us meet the child where she is. Um, so what we want are those two things, help children experience success now, meet children where they are. And universal design offers ways to help us do that. So um, there's two primary principles in universal design for learning that we wanna share with you today. The first one is we want to remove barriers to children's success. And then the second is we wanna provide options to increase the likelihood of their success. So if you think about it this way, I think this visual is helpful for me at least. Um, this could be, let's say we're planning, you're planning a lesson, something in the classroom. Um, we wanna identify barriers ahead of time and remove those right away. So get rid of that fence, get rid of these hurdles. So when we're planning for something, we wanna make sure there's not a, an additional barrier for children who has language differences. We wanna make sure there's not an additional barrier for children who haven't had a lot of experiences in a school setting. Even uh, just another example for a child who struggles with fine motor skills. Um, we don't want any of those things to get in the way to their success. Um, and so then the second principle, once we've done that, once we've removed clear hurdles that stand in the way, then we really wanna think about three things that we can do. Um, and this is providing multiple options for recruiting and maintaining children's interest and their motivation, options for presenting instruction and information, and then options for learning about what children know and can do. And uh, Universal Designs for Learning, I just, we can't say enough about how if you have interest in this, you should go to the CAST website, C-A-S-T website. There's so many incredible resources there. So you could spend days um, watching videos and looking at all their resources. But Universal Design for Learning is framed around these three networks, they call them the Effective Network, the Recognition Network, and the Strategic Networks. And these are framed based on neuroscience. The easiest way for me to remember um, universal design for learning principles is that what we're focusing on is engagement, how we get children to be motivated and stay with us and focused, um, how we represent materials, content, knowledge to them, and then how they take action and express that back to us. So for me, it's easy to think of how they show us what they know. And so there's this... Um, wording that they use in universal design a lot. They want you to use multiple means. So multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, multiple means of action and expression. And here are just some examples of how we conceive of that. Um, when you're thinking about multiple means of engagement, we definitely wanna recruit children's interests. So how, what's more than one way that I can get children interested in this topic? Um, then we want to provide options for sustaining their effort and then persisting. So are there, let's find multiple ways for them to successfully stay interested and engaged. And then can I help them with multiple options for their self-regulation so that they can stay engaged? Then multiple means of representation. I think we can never spend too much time on this. 
um, can we do more than just tell children something? So multiple ways, we wanna provide multiple opportunities for them to perceive something besides just hearing our voice, for instance. Are there multiple options for them to see things and hear things and use symbols and language? And then are there multiple ways that we can help them comprehend the things that we're sharing with them? And then the final one is uh, we wanna provide multiple means of action and expression, which for me, that just means give learners different ways to show us what they know. So can we provide them multiple opp opportunities for how they physically interact and show us what's happening? Um, multiple options for them and how they express and communicate that back to us. And then this is key, somebody talked about executive function skills. You can see how self-regulation and executive function skills are an important piece of this. Um, there's multiple ways for them to think about their thinking and organize their thoughts so that they have an opportunity to show us what they know. So those are the big three of universal design. And this is really important because I think we can sometimes get confused about this. Um, in a special ed framework, universal design involves that we're making changes for all children, not just for a single child. So we don't just plow ahead with our regular traditional planning and then create some adaptations and accommodations for a single child. Universal design is literally upending and changing everything we do for all children to make sure that we can do this in these three areas. And I'm gonna hand things off to Tyler, but I guess, you know, feel free to, to drop in the chat any questions you have or comments about, before I do, about this, this piece. So Nikki, in the chat, we have a couple, um, Lacey and Marissa uh, commented about um, some adaptations like a wiggle cushion and how those are sometimes difficult to communicate to other students, um, why, why they're using them, why other kids can't use them. Um, and so, and Lacey also added uh, educating children on why we all have different tools is critical um, and children are accepting of that explanation. Sure. Um, so kids yes. needing Bring it that. in order to learn, but I just didn't know if you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, I would love to comment on that. I'm really glad that you brought that up, Lacey. And I think that this is a great example of something. Let's talk about what universally designing a space would be differently than just adding that accommodation for a single child. So a universally designed response to how children can sit in different ways to engage would mean all children have access to a cushion if they want it. Not just a single children has a special one just for them. So um, that's just something to maybe challenge our thinking a little bit, but if we're gonna give children multiple ways to engage in a circle time so that they can sit comfortably, then that would mean every child, no matter who it is in the classroom, might have an opportunity to use some different tools to sit on those. So um, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Anything else in the chat? Okay, then Tyler. All right, so I'm going to talk with you guys a little bit about Wyoming's Coherent Path to Quality document today. I'm going to drop a link right now in the chat um, where you can access that digitally. And you can also request hard copies um, from the collaborative and from your regional facilitator. If you guys would like one, we'd be happy to get one to you. It's an awesome resource. And I will share a little bit first about what it is and how it was created, just some background. Uh, so this is a new document to our state and we're really excited about it. Um, it was created by a quality learning network and that network was made up of educators, families, um, the collaborative, and we created it with the guidance of an organization called Leading for Children and they facilitated discussions with the quality learning network for about eight months. Um, and then we get we combined everything we learned from each other um, and created Wyoming specific indicators for quality. Um, and these indicators are called simple rules in this document. And the simple rules are organized under each part of the framework that you see here. So there's simple rules for relationships and interactions, emotional and physical environment and learning experiences. And we know that all of those things combined improve outcomes for children. And the purpose of this document, um, oh, just one. Sorry, Tyler. No, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> the purpose of this document was just to make quality holdable, um, which means just basically anyone can pick this up, any group, any individual can pick up this document and look in it and understand what we, um, what we view quality as in Wyoming. 
Um, and this is for kids um, birth to age eight. No. Oh, um, this document literally, like I said, can be used by anyone. And these are just some examples of how different groups could use this document. So for educators, it's a workbook style reflection guide. Um, it can help with goal setting um, and professional and program development. Um, families can use this as a search tool when they're trying to find um, the right fit for their child as far as an educational or care setting. Uh, they can use it to strengthen their partnerships with um, their children's teachers and caregivers, and then also use it to support their own children's development. So to examine um, how they're using each part of that framework in, in their own space. And then public stakeholders. So these are folks that are making policy for our kiddos um, on the government level or um, even local levels. So people that are on the school board, people that are on boards for um, preschool programs um, and CDCs, they can use this to um, create a consistent vocabulary and language um, and just so that people are hearing the same consistent um, words across the, across the state about what, what quality means for us and then can also be used for advocacy um, and increasing understanding. So just when, when early childhood educators are saying, this is what um, we're doing to provide quality in our program, um, we can create an understanding that's more level across the board so that everyone knows what's going on in those programs. And so now we're gonna look at just how we can use the coherent path to quality. That's the CP2Q. We, um, that's a lot of words to type out. So I think Becca came up with that maybe. <laughs> but um, to put universal design for learning into practice. So we're gonna peek at this visual again. So these are the networks um, and universal design and it's just that inside out model. So the effective network is the why of learning. What grabs our attention? What gets us engaged? What um, motivates students to want to learn about something? And then the recognition is what? So. Um, how are they getting that information? Um, how are we giving it to them? How are they seeing and hearing and experiencing that? And then the how of learning. So that's when they're showing us um, what they know and what opportunities are we giving them um, to express what they've learned. We're gonna compare those now to the framework of a coherent path. And um, the simple rules in relationships and interactions are authentic. So you're being honest, real, and sincere, responsive. Um, you're connecting in real time. You're seeing what's going on with your students and responding to that accordingly. Um, reciprocal, so two-way and equal. So you're hearing voices as much as you're um, offering your voice. And then consistent. So students know how you're gonna respond to certain things. Um, families know how you will respond to them. Um, and you are just creating trust in those relationships when you respond consistently. And so <laughs> we have a little quote on the side. Um, relationships are the foundations for all learning. And um, that's all the scientists saying those words. <laughs> we have a direct quote from yes. all the scientists. <laughs> yes. So really, this is just just found in research over and over again. And we're, we were being for sure sarcastic about this quote, but um, it just comes up every time that relationships are, are what grow learning in all people, adults, children, everyone. So these are some questions you can ask yourself when you're thinking about um, engaging students and, and getting them motivated to learn. What are my students interested in, both as a group and as individuals? What are they um, coming to you and talking about and sharing with you about what they did over the weekend or what um, what's something they might have saw, what they're talking to their friends about? Um, and what gets them excited to learn about something? Is it when you're excited? Is it when it's something that um, you hear about in a story they share and you bring it to life in your classroom? Um, and then what, um, what motivates them uh, to learn? So what are the things that engage them and, and they're excited to jump into? So there are some questions you can think through. Um, and those are opportunities to increase success. So one of those principles of universal design. So 
knowing what you know about students um, and your relationships with them can increase their chance of success because you know what is going to be a good fit for them. And then the emotional and physical environments um, correlate really well with the recognition network. So the way that we're presenting information. And then when we have an environment, both physical and emotional, that is safe. So um, they feel like it, there, it's not too much of a risk to learn. Uh, they feel respected, um, both adults and families and your colleagues. They know that um, in your space, they're gonna be empowered and involved. And then predictable, so reliable and organized. They know where to go for certain information. They know where to get materials that they need to expand their learning. Um, and then that the, you're responding consistently as well, like we mentioned um, in the relationships aspect. And then accessible. So this is, this is what we tend to think of a lot with universal design, right? Is our environment accessible in terms of um, it, can somebody come in with assistive technology or um, equipment and can they navigate our classroom? But this is, this is we're thinking about all children here. So um, our materials where all children can reach them are, um, do they know where they're at if they need them? And then are you accessible um, as well? So do they know they can ask you a question? Do they know they can reach out to you um, to be someone to help them uh, take that little bit of a risk and expand their knowledge? So by offering students a space in which content can be viewed and experienced in several, several ways and styles, um, we support this network. And this is also part of removing barriers, right? Like we visited about earlier, which is another principle of universal design. Working on it, Tyler. You're good. Here we go. <laughs> so these are some questions you can ask yourself um, about the what of learning. So in what ways do I currently present information? Um, and am I presenting it in multiple ways? So do we tend to present um, content the same way across different topics. Uh, Char will share a little bit more about this earlier or later, but um, about some stuff about backwards design. And so this is, that will break this down a little bit more for you. And then um, what are some presentation methods you could add? So is there a new way or a different way that you could um, give content to kids and just thinking a little bit outside the box about the way so finally, this is the third part of the framework um, and its learning opportunities. And this, this blends so well with the strategic network. So how are we giving kids ways to show us what they know and, and what they've learned? So if we provide meaningful, so um, content relates the new to the familiar, um, and if, we, if they're exploratory, so they are engaging in hands-on investigation and exploration, and then they're actionable, um, so they can use these skills later. They can see the purpose um, of, of the things that they're doing and, and know that they're gonna be able to apply those skills and knowledge later in their lives. Um, these are ways that we can both reduce barriers and increase success for our students. And so we're giving them tons of opportunity to show us what they know. Um, and this is part of, especially I think, um, removing barriers. So in what way are we giving them real applicable practice um, to show us what they know and, and removing those things that maybe don't apply to what we want, um, we want them to express uh, and giving them a real clear opportunity to um, be their own best resource and um, and show us what they really, really can do. And then some questions you can ask yourself are, do you give multiple ways to demonstrate um, learning? So is, is an assessment only accessible through um, a written format or are they only able to use verbal um, expression? And do you favor one way for children to show their learning over others. So sometimes we like to, like when I was in the classroom, I preferred as an educator to present one way. And so I found myself after doing some reflecting, realizing that that's how I preferred it, students to give me information back. And so I had to broaden my perspective and say, okay, that might not be um, how this child can express that, that knowledge to me. And so how can I find other ways for them to do that? 
Um, and then how can you incorporate more methods again to express um, and have them demonstrate learning? And so to illustrate this a little bit, um, I thought I could share an experience that I had. So I, when I was um, in a classroom, I worked with diverse students uh, in a resource center. So they were on all different levels of um, learning and ability. And so I used backwards design like Char will talk about and universal design every day. And so this was an opportunity for kids to show me um, what they knew in a way that was accessible for them. So I got out these three materials, Play-Doh, dice, and some glass beads. And we all sat at the table together. And I explained that we were going to, um, that we were going to practice our numbers. So that was, that was my goal for this activity. We were gonna try and find out some of the number knowledge that our students had. And I knew based on my relationships with each kiddo that they were gonna express this differently and that this activity was gonna look different for each of them. So some kiddos, they were using the Play-Doh um, to practice just being at the table in a group. And they were playing with these materials and experiencing them, getting familiar with them. And they were um, joining conversation. They weren't necessarily counting, doing one-to-one -one correspondence, but they were engaging with the materials with us. They were getting exposure to those dice and the, and the individual numbers expressed on those. Um, and they were getting a sensory experience and a social experience. And then there was kiddos who were kind of playing with the dice, but were also putting the glass beads into the Play-Doh. And, and we were encouraging them to count the beads as they put them in or take them out. Um, and then I had kiddos on that upper level of ability who were rolling the dice and counting the numbers and then taking it to the next level of adding the corresponding number of glass beads into their Play-Doh. Um, and then there were some kids that were also doing addition. So they were rolling and adding, and then they were rolling and count and continuing on with their counting. Um, and we had kids even requesting writing materials to, to write out their numbers that they, that they rolled. And so this was just a great opportunity to remove those barriers for some students who may not have been able to do a one-to-one -one correspondence worksheet, um, but they were still able to engage with us and um, hear those that math vocab and engage with their um, peers at an activity where everyone got to use the same material. And so all of this to just say um, that if we truly know our students um, and details about their lives and we reflect that knowledge in our physical and emotional environments, um, learning will become more meaningful and achievable for everyone. And I can't see the chat right now. So before I pass to my colleague, Shar, was there anything in there that we need to mention? I'm looking. Um, Tyler, also just, I think maybe we should just give a shout out too. If you want to know more, that was like the speediest introduction to Wyoming's Coherent Path to Quality yeah. ever. Um, and so we just want you all to know that if you want more information about that, we just completed a series of three um, ECHO and early childhood education sessions about um, the Coherent Path to Quality. We have a podcast that's about the Coherent Path and some other resources at our website. So um, if that seemed overwhelming, there's a lot of ways to engage and find out more about that. So we just want to invite you to check that out. So um, in, the, in the chat, Dina said that she loved that you brought up offering extension activities for those who show proficiency, and this is often overlooked. Thanks, Dina. One of my favorite things about, <clears throat> excuse me, about Tyler's example is that she did not plan four activities for the kids at different levels. She didn't say, okay, so the, I know these ones um, have a hard time with this. So I'm going to plan this activity for them, this activity for the group that are, are getting it. And this for those kids that are a little bit higher, she planned one activity but it was, it was flexible, it was open-ended. And so everyone was participating in the same activity, but it was on the level that they needed and they got something out of it. They got what they needed out of it because they had, it had that flexibility and openness to it. And it wasn't different from each other. It was all the same activity. I thought that was really powerful. 
Thanks, Sharon. Okay, I guess I'm gonna take it away then <laughs> for the next part. So to go along with what, what Tyler was saying, just truly knowing our students, um, I wanna talk a little bit about our dispositions and knowing our students and knowing ourselves. Um, I know that everyone here, I mean, if we work with students and children, it's because we love them. And I know that that's true of everyone here, but it is really important um, to stop and really think about what our thoughts, what our deep feelings, our core beliefs of our students are, because that sets the tone for our interactions and experiences that we give them. And it's really, really important for us to reflect. So I'd like to invite you to take this, take a few minutes with me and to really reflect about how you think about students and, um, as, because that's just really good for all of us to continually be doing so we can continue to grow and become better. Um, it's really important that we realize that if we're making dangerous assumptions about our students, it could have a lasting negative effect. And we do, I know none of us want that, but it can happen without us even realizing. And so we need to stop and, and really think about it. Just like Nikki was talking about that success that we want our students to have and to build on. Um, we need to we need to be ready for that. So that brings us to the least dangerous assumption. We took this from an article. Um, it's it will be in the resources hopefully that you get. Um, but it's just assuming that the child is competent and able to learn. We're assuming that poor performance is due to instructional inadequacy rather than student deficits. That's a really powerful way of thinking of it. Um, so part of truly knowing our students is not putting too much weight on those test scores and other teachers' opinions of them. If you know other teachers and they've had a certain student and they tell you some things about that student, sometimes it's hard to let go of their perception of the student and be open to finding out your own. Um, so let's talk about some of the dangerous assumptions that we could have. And I would like you to just kind of think about there. And if you think of more dangerous assumptions, please put them in the chat and add them. These are just some that came from this article. And then a few that Nikki and Tyler and I had thought of. Um, one of those is, is that this child does not want to learn. Um, there are gaps that we see are a sign that they don't, that they lack intelligence, that they're not very smart. Um, students with disabilities cannot learn general education content, so they should be in a different place, a different space. Um, teaching must focus on deficits. Children that are learning English are not as intelligent as their peers. Tests give us more relative, or sorry, relevant information about a child than everything else we know. And diverse families are a problem and thinking of diverse, just anything that is different than what we're used to or what we have as far as our family, as far as our beliefs is a problem and it's their fault. And that will cause barriers definitely in the students learning. So please, if you've thought of any, put them in the chat, just any other dangerous assumptions that, that we might have without even realizing it. Um, for sure, if we realize we have these, then we, we work to change them. And that's part of the goal of us talking about them. Um, because what the most dangerous assumption is that this isn't working. So there must be something wrong with the child or with that student. But the least dangerous assumption is this isn't working. So I can do something a little bit different. I can adjust what I'm doing. I can be the one, like Nikki said earlier, with that little child and that closing that gap, I can take on that burden of change and be the one to make a difference, not leaving it on that student to do so. In doing this, it's really re valuing relationships and keeping that growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. Sorry, Nikki, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so one way to do this is to use backward design. So we've, we've heard about universal design for learning. 
we've heard about this amazing new tool, the Co Wyoming's Coherent Path to Quality, and how they tie together so beautifully. They're both research, science-based. They're what we need to be doing for children, but they're kind of, sometimes it feels like they're a little bit out there, like not out there, but they're, it's hard to hold on to completely. And so in doing that, we wanted to talk to you about backward design because it's kind of just an, a good way to, to focus and to be able to use these strategies and apply them in our practice. So we're going to talk about this. Um, educators usually approach course design in a forward design manner. And so they think about how to teach the content and develop assessments around their learning activities. And then they draw connections to the learning goals of the course. But with backward design, we would consider the learning goals of the course first. We know that we have those standards we have to achieve, right? So looking at those standards, looking at the goals that we need and we want students to walk away from our class with, and then making goals of what, how we are, can get them to where we want them to be. So once we have the goals, the next thing we need to look at is the assessment. So backward design is focused on students learning and understanding. So a lot of times when teachers are designing lessons, um, they often focus on the activities and the instruction rather than the outputs of the instruction. So we're focusing more on teaching rather than learning. And we definitely want our focus to be on learning. So backward design is intentionally thinking about that during the design process. We're continually encouraging the educators to establish the purpose of doing something before implementing it into the the curriculum. So why am I doing this? Just really thinking it through of designing. And again, I want you to think about those beautiful spaces that Nikki showed us at the beginning. When you look at those steps that were also a ramp, it was beautiful, it was functional, and it was accessible for everyone. It wasn't something that could have happened after the stairs were made. That went into that design of those, of that, those steps and getting up into that building had the design, the ramp had to be part of it from the very beginning, from the first moment. So we need to look at it in that way. Once the learning goals are established and they've been identified, then we will have an easier time developing the assessments and then the instruction of how to um, get that learning. We need to be transparent and explicit in our instruction. We'll have a better idea of what you want the students to get out of your learning activities and it eliminates the possibility of doing certain activities and tasks for the sake of doing them and that happens a lot i think i know it has for me in the past um, every task and piece of information has a purpose that fits in with the overarching goals and the goals of the course and one one thought that i have is if you as a teacher have your standards and your goals so well defined in your mind that you know where you've already planned, you know where you want those students to be, then as you're teaching different concepts, you can listen to what the students are bringing to the lessons and to the experiences. And you can clap onto those things and, and use them to get to your end goal. We always want to be using our students as guides in what we teach, right? But if we don't know our end goal, then we can miss those opportunities that would lead us to where we, we still wanna go, but have the, the student help us get there. Um, I think about classrooms where I've been in a space where the teacher has such a understanding of where she wants her students to be, that when a student brings up a subject that maybe wasn't in her lesson plan, but it will still get to that end goal, she's able to follow that and really engage the students in what they want to do while getting to the same goal, because she just has that so set in her mind. And that is just to me, what is, that's what teaching is. It's you being creative, you being open, you knowing what you want so well that when you can be flexible and adaptable in bringing in what the students want to do, but still reaching your goal, not letting them get you sidetracked. You're not getting sidetracked. You're, you're just bringing in what they want to do along with what you know they need. 
Um, so teaching is not just about engaging students in content. It's also about ensuring students have the resources necessary to understand. So let's talk about how to do this. So if you go to the next slide, Nikki. All right, so these are the three stages of backward design. And um, it, the number one is to identify the desired results. And the, the way that we tie that into UDL is dun, 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 UDL removing barriers, just like Nikki had talked about earlier. So as we're identifying the desired results, this is the perfect time to remove those barriers. One example of this is if you are asking your students to retell um, something that happened last summer and your goal is to find out if that student is, um, is able to tell a, retell a story. Well, by asking them about something that's clear from last summer, you're throwing up, actually throwing up a lot of barriers. Um, it was a long time ago. Maybe they're not able to remember it. So you could, you can remove those barriers in that moment and make it more um, accommodating for everyone. What did they do during recess today? That's already happened. They can retell a story, but it's not, um, it's not putting barriers in their way. So we really, we really need to focus. What do I really want to know? When I want them, am I asking them to write down something um, to show knowledge of it? Okay, that's fine. But that means that I'm assessing more of their, their writing style. Are they able, their fine motor movement, all of those things. If that's what you want to assess, that's perfectly fine. But if you're wanting the actual content, then you're putting barriers up. So we really need to focus on what do I really need to know? <laughs> and how can I remove all the barriers that are in the way so that I can find out if they know it? Okay, number two is we want to determine acceptable evidence. And I kind of crossed over into that when I was, when I was talking about the other, but what is the evidence that I, that the child or student can show me? And that ties in with universal design for learning. That's what UDL stands for, um, multiple means of action and expression. So what are the ways that I can, that they can show me they understand? Maybe like Tyler was saying, maybe they wouldn't be able to sit down and do a worksheet, but if given some open-ended materials, they're able to show you that they can add and subtract and they can say it to you. Um, it's, it's really, really important that we know exactly what we want and find different ways for them to show us what it is. Um, one of the things that I love this example that, that Nikki has used a few times for me mm -hmm. to help me understand this as well, is that if we are wanting, um, our students to, or if we ourselves are wanting to learn how to golf better and we're getting all like, we're wanting to improve our swing, um, we cannot write a poem about it to become better at our swing. If I wrote a song about it, I would not become a better golfer. <laughs> I would, it'd be really cool, but it wouldn't make me a better golfer. So it's really important that we, we, have, to, we have to focus on those things that will actually get us to where we want to be and what we need. Okay, next one is the, is to plan the learning experiences and instruction. So I just kind of led into that. So that means universal design for learning, multiple means of engagement. We want to engage them in lots of ways to do it, but it does need to be applicable to what we're doing. We, we do need to make it so that they are getting what they need out of it and they're representing it in different ways. So that, it, so that it applies to them. So basically what we're saying is we're gonna remove, we're gonna identify the goals so that we can remove barriers. We are going to determine the acceptable um, evidence by giving them multiple means of action and expression. They can show us in many ways that they understand. And this is all the students, right? And we are figuring out how we want to engage with them. We're going to engage them in the learning. 
with number three. We're going to grab their interest and, and help them to learn more. Um, by doing these things, we are definitely, um, we know our goals for learning, the different ways that the students can show their learning and the methods of UDL can be implemented to make the learning more accessible for all. And that means it's literally, it's built in and it's not bolted on afterwards. So the hope is, is that you as teachers already have a lot to do. You're very busy and have um, a lot asked of you. But if we are looking at it in this way, with the end, at the, uh, looking at the end at the very beginning, looking at ex that acceptable evidence with multiple means of action and expression, and then we're planning how that's going to happen using multiple means of engagement, then we are able to build that universal design so that everyone is learning better from the beginning. We're not putting in extra lessons. We're not putting in extra activities. We're not giving ourselves extra work. We're actually, because we're doing it this way, it's more simplified and it's more accessible to everyone. Everybody wins. It's better for the teachers as well. Just like with Tyler's lesson with the Play-Doh and the dice and the, the beads, they were able to just do such a simple but powerful lesson together and it accomplished so many things and did not make extra work for Tyler. She was able to assess all of those things with one lesson. And to me, that's what backward design is really about. So are there any questions, comments, anything that wants that anybody wants to say about these things? You can put it in the chat or I would love to hear any comments. I also think it's really powerful to reflect on learning experiences that we have found beneficial or that we remember. So whether an, a learning experience that we've had as an, as an adult or something from our childhood that we remember. And so I'm wondering if we could take some time to think about a learning experience that was really impactful for us um, and share that in the chat and why we think we remember that. And then um, and then maybe how we can use some of those strategies in our own classrooms. I love that idea. Well, while you guys are doing that, I have a, <laughs> so one, the thing that pops in my head when I think about backward design, this is gonna sound really strange and I'm gonna kind of nerd out for a second. But when I think about backward design, I think about the, a really good book. So, you know, when you're reading a book and it has all of these elements that just grab your attention and they all, by the end of the book, they all tie together and they go to, they just support that goal. Um, one of the ways that I see to think of that is Harry Potter. I'm reading Harry Potter books with my kids right now. <laughs> and when you're in book two and you're reading about certain things, you're like, huh, that's interesting. Why are we, why are we reading about that? But then you get to book five and you're like, oh my gosh, it all ties together. <laughs> I think that also shows the power of like revisiting Char when you have read the series and you read it again and then you you read those things and you're like oh I, I know now and it just makes I think it makes it more interesting um I'm also nerding out a little bit about that right now <laughs> all right so oh here we go does any did anyone hop in the chat not yet not yet. I put the question in there in case we okay. missed it, but so far nobody has added anything in the okay. chat. And um, I can check on it too. Okay. If you want to keep monitoring that, what, one thing we thought we'd do um, because we have extra time uh, with you all is think about some more practice. Oh, great. We got some comments too, so we can share those in just a second. But um, after we hear from some of your comments in the chat, I think we'll get really specific into some practice. So different times of the day and thinking about maybe how we can remove some barriers and how we can universally design. So we'll try out some of that. Um, and then, but we'd, what we'd love for you to be thinking about as well is questions you have about difficult, challenging times of day or problems in your own practice where you'd really like to try to apply these principles, but you might need a little help from the group. So we'll have a little bit of discussion around that as well. But did you want to share that? Ch anything from the chat? 
looks like um, Karen said, I like how the progression with UBD, with UDL details aligns with PLC conversations that we want kids to know, right? What we want kids to know, how we will know they learned it and what we do when they don't or, um, or already have. That's great. Thanks. That's a great idea. PLCs can do that as well. Thanks, Karen. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about a, an example from practice that can sort of be problematic um, and talk through what we can do about it. So there are, um, we're gonna talk about the circle time example, and then we're going to sort of think through what we can do to make like story, circle, meeting time, whatever you want it in a class setting, um, more universally designed as an experience. So if we project uh, thinking about a traditional circle time, it, it you know, could look like this in a classroom. There are some barriers that are inherently built into that that we often don't reflect on with children. Um, and some of those barriers include that like the object of interest, whatever book you're reading, and the child are far removed from each other. And you can already um, anticipate some children may struggle in this setting, your children that do struggle in this setting. Um, this could be a barrier for some. So when the distance between the child and the object of interest is increased, that's gonna be a barrier for some of your kids, particularly kids with disabilities, particularly kids that are English, English language learners. The other thing that tends to happen during circle time or story is that the contact with the object of interest decreases while distractions increase. So the object of interest is further away and also you're sitting with people right next to you on a rug that touch you and breathe and do all kinds of things that could be distracting for you. Um, and then what tends to happen is instruction and communication from the teacher uh, becomes more generalized because you're speaking to everybody in the group. All three of those areas are can be a real barrier for children. Did someone have a comment? No? Okay. We, we do have something in the chat. Sure. Is uh, Lacey says, all of my most powerful learning moments were actual experiences. Oh, thanks, Lacey. That's a, that's a lot for us to think about. So let's talk about how we could decrease those three barriers during a circle story time setting. Um, so we can just plow ahead with planning it as usual. And then we can give some kids something weighted to hold on their lap, or we can have them have something to wiggle on. Um, but that's, and that's an accommodation for that single child, or we can try to remove those berries for all children. One way you can do that is to decrease the distance between the child and the object of interest. So that book, is there something related to that book that could be held by children? Can you make sure you get up and bring that book close to children while you engage them in that activity? What can you do that, sh that shrinks that distance between the object of interest and the child? Another example would be how can you provide more opportunities for contact and decrease distractions. So what could you do and how children sit and what it is that you're doing with them in that setting that could help decrease those problems. And then finally, how can you in your instruction provide more clear and focused instruction and not just general broad communication um, that might be misunderstood or not heard uh, by some of the children. So we start with this in, in this example in story time, let's try to remove those barriers as much as we possibly can for children. And then what we wanna do is increase their opportunities for success. So this is something we'd like for you guys to help us out with. So um, we need you in the chat um, to help us with this, but first let's just start with, can you brainstorm for us multiple ways you can engage children with a story? Get them there, get them to wanna stay with you, get them to keep focusing and paying attention when you're reading a book to the class. So what are multiple ways that you do that? Antoinette says real objects and actions, using actions. Mm -hmm. Great. Flexible seating, props and objects, movement and actions, <clears throat> Lacey. Yeah, it's great. One thing we would do with our kiddos that um, really like to engage physically with the book is we would photocopy it. Maybe that's not legal. At least some pictures of it ahead of time and give them pictures to hold from the story. So that's the way to. Absolutely. Yeah. Dina says use voices and inflection relating it to their experiences. 
And mm -hmm. Susan echoed that voice inflection. Yeah. Lacey mentioned felt board because then they can interact with the story. Mm hmm. It's great. My thought was if there's any way to make it bigger, <clears throat> I know some people yeah. we, we have limited access to some things, but if we could somehow project it, I don't know, was, was my thought too, is just make it larger so everybody can see better. I love that. And I just tossed in some, some, you know, some thoughts and you guys already, you already addressed all of them. There's a lot of ways we can keep, get them engaged and keep them engaged. Right. So then how can we find multiple ways to share information in that setting? So let's do this again. Drop in the chat for us, your ideas. How do you find multiple ways to share information with them during, during a circle or story? Find video or other pictures to increase their background knowledge. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I think we could ask, uh, we often miss the opportunity to ask children what they already know, or maybe some of their understanding of the book or whatever your present the concept whatever you have for them in circle time so asking them what they already know and, and listening to their conversation mm -hmm. so I think that's a great example Tyler just some some ideas that I had related to that um, I mean basically for me when I'm thinking about multiple means of representation I just continually say to myself I need to do more than just tell children what can I do besides just tell them the information or tell them what I want them to do? Um, so for me, it's that, like there's other ways that we can communicate with them besides just telling. Okay, so then this one, the, the final one, what are, how can we provide multiple ways for children to show us what they know during a circle time experience? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Marissa said, we recently asked the children what they wanted to learn about and got books related to those things. That's amazing. Yes. Deanna shared act out a scene. Perfect. Um, and Christina shared ver uh, verbal with pictures. Um, I'm assuming kids like drawing pictures is what she means and then making videos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you all are great at this. These are, these, are, these are wonderful examples. Ask them to share with a group or with their neighbor, Susan suggested. That's nice. I think that's really nice, Susan, because um, there's more than one way to share verbally, right? And there's some children that will have less success if they have to try to speak in front of the whole group, but they can say something to their neighbor, right? Yeah, I think the same thing goes. Uh, do we expect children to just only tell us things? Can we find other ways besides them just telling us? So I um, love those examples. And just one thought, one thought that I'm having now, Nikki, is just when we, when we would do certain stories, um, such as like the Three Little Pigs, um, we would leave manipulatives and objects out for them to play with and then we would just observe when they're playing with those objects and those different things are they retelling the story mm -hmm. and a lot of times they were and that was them that was them telling us what they knew without us actually telling them what they knew <laughs> yeah I think that's really powerful because another option would be you know to give them one thing on a piece of paper that they have to respond to to tell you about that story and that's going to be a barrier for some kids um, yeah. yeah and another thought that i have is you know why do they have to tell us at this exact moment like <laughs> right now you have to tell me what you know why can't it be okay over the next few days i'm going to provide all these opportunities for you to show me what you know in a different way oh here's some paper and pictures of pigs next to it. I don't know. You yeah. just have lots of opportunity. It doesn't have to be this moment because now is when I want to know. Sure. Yep. Christina um, also shared conferencing sessions with an adult. So I'm I'm assuming that means like one-on-one -on -one with the kiddo. So like oh, yeah. 
scared. Um, sometimes kids aren't going to share with the large group or it might be a little bit shy with peers, but they'll for sure share with you one-on-one -on -one as an adult. Um, and that's part of just knowing them, right? Those relationships, knowing how a child's going to respond um, and show their knowledge and, and feel safe to do yeah. that. Um, yeah. And then other ideas have been create or give them an opportunity to do a modified reader theater using pictures mm -hmm. um, and this will help them grasp the storyline, recreate their own story in the mode of their choice um, and create a tactile book or an ebook. Yeah, great idea. And then Lacey also shared um, that in their preschool, they do studies rather than themes. They provide several different options via activities for a week or two. And then whatever the kids gravitate towards, they use that as their study. Mm -hmm. that's, that's exciting using that emergent approach, Lacey. Okay, so just some other application you could think about is uh, using some a tool like this, for instance, just other times um, during a early childhood classroom day. So a particular routine you could um, write down the routine. You you want to start where with that backward design piece that Shar talked about. So what are the goals? What does it look like to be successful in that routine? Actually, and then think about what barriers you need to remove first. Then think about multiple ways you can engage children, multiple ways you can share information, and multiple ways that that children can show you what they know and can do. So just wanted to offer that as a suggestion you could also do. And then just a few other things um, that are that could be possible applications related to universal design for learning would be to specific events, activities, or interaction actions. So if you're guiding children through routine, just, just think about multiple ways of representing your expectations. So once again, are we just telling? Or are there other ways that I can help them through with this routine? Um, and you guys are great at offering some suggestions like that in circle time. The same thing can apply with just about any routine. Um, and then honestly, the truth is that if a routine doesn't lend itself well to being universally designed, it's probably not a great activity to do for children. So that's one way. If it feels like, well, this is such a stress to, to universally design this for kids, then it might mean that you shouldn't, you should consider a different activity. <laughs> it might not be appropriate. Um, so think about what things are easy to universally design and let's do some more of that with kids. And then just Tyler's example is one of the, one of the best examples I've heard about what open-ended materials can do. Um, because when there are open-ended materials and children can choose what happens, that's their engagement. It's already built in. There are multiple ways that they can engage. Um, they can access those based on the things that they know and connect with the things they know and understand. So it represents that those things to them. And then they're able to show you exactly like Shar's example that she shared, multiple ways that they might be able to show you they can retell a story, right? About the three pigs or something. So can't stress enough why open-ended materials are used in early childhood is because it's, it's built in, they're created and built for children's learning. And, and this also needs to be guided by adults. So skillful and engaged adults that facilitate that also can really help meet those three guidelines. So if you're engaging in playful learning in guided play with children, um, then they're engaged and motivated because they're making choices about what they do. Um, it also means that they're understanding expectations and possibilities, you're right there with them. And it means that they're able to use materials and interact with others to demonstrate what the things that they know and understand. So just a couple of other, other thoughts for all of you. Um, and then, you know, that's, that's the bulk of our content for you today, but we would just love for you to have an opportunity before we close to tell us a little bit about questions that you have related to universal design. Have you, have you tried backward design? before. And I would love to hear about if you've used backward design as a strategy, what kinds of successes you've had with that and any advice or recommendations that you have for anybody here about using that. So we'll just take a few minutes and let you just sort of in the chat, let's just hear your thoughts.
while we're waiting for people to think, because it does take a minute to process and, and type it in. So no pressure to be in too big of a rush. But <clears throat> as I've tried to use this in my, um, in my own practice, as far as like trainings for those professional learning opportunities for my region, it's been really interesting because it's helped me shift my focus from these activities that I thought were really awesome and important <laughs> and made me realize that maybe they don't actually lend themselves to exactly what I need. And so it's made my, it's made my, um, these learning opportunities more powerful and impactful because I guess it's kind of like it's cut out the fluff of other things and it's, they've still been engaging and enjoyable, but they just haven't had that, um, that stuff that I like, sometimes I would think of this idea and I'd really want to do it because it seemed like it'd be really fun or whatever. And then um, I, I found myself building my training around that activity <laughs> rather than around what I want them to learn from that. So that was really powerful for, that has been really powerful for me to mm -hmm. come up with that backward design. Like, what do I want them to get out of this? And then building it from there. And then sometimes you throw out that activity, but it ends up being even better than it would have been with that really cool activity in my experience. Yeah, thanks, sure. Karen asked in the chat, are there any UDL strategies specifically related to being mindful of trauma, um, COVID experiences of isolation, et cetera? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I just saw that question and I'm, I'm looking for a resource right now that I'd like to share. Just gonna take me just a minute to find it. Um, Nikki, while you're looking for that, can I just jump in right there to kind of piggyback on Shar's response? Yes, please. Um, actually, Karen had put something in the chat earlier about um, PLC and the importance of tying all this together. Um, we were just having a conversation this last week with a group um, about early childhood PLC and, and talking about really the, that really is so important because we can't know where we're going unless we have an end in mind, really. And so, um, and so looking at it that way and seeing where we're headed and where, what we want them to learn instead of what we're trying to teach, I think really takes out, you know, we're, we get so hung up on we have to get through this entire curriculum. And yet then we are, we're leaving some of those children in the dust when they're not getting it and we're not paying attention because if they're not learning the pieces as we go, we can't keep going because by the time we get to that end, they're not gonna be even anywhere close to closing the gap into that, you know, into those pieces. And so it just has really made me um, think about that a lot differently as well. You really do, have to have that end goal in mind and where you're headed before you can continue on your path. That is such a great point. I'm, yeah, so, I'm so glad you said that. And Susan uh, supported that as well. She said, it makes perfect sense to know the end game and not focus the planning on the next skill and then the next, et cetera. And that's just so easy to do. Just yeah. Go next thing is this and you know and it's it's short-sighted but it it makes sense because that's the way curriculums are set up a lot of times I mean it makes yeah. sense that we do that but it's just I, think, I think part of the reason why we do it too is because we're focused on ourselves and we want to get it right as teachers so we spend a lot of time thinking about teaching and less time thinking about learning so what are these things I'm going to do and then we can just get lost there and uh, we can spend all day thinking about teaching instead of about learning um I, I wanted to share a resource um, because I'm, I'm so glad that you asked the question, um, Karen, about how this relates to trauma because I think it's a perfect fit. Um, these universal design principles, uh, we want to universally design our spaces so that children who have experienced it um, have the opportunity to succeed. And I, I did just wanna share a resource that we have from the Professional Learning Collaborative that it's one of those kinds of resources that it feels simple and really obvious, but it's actually deeply embedded in neuroscience and the science of trauma informed practice. But there are basically some things we know will help children who have experienced trauma succeed. And those can be found here. And I'm just gonna try to make it so that you can see these bullets okay, but shocking, the first thing that's most important to support kids that have experienced trauma is to strengthen relationships. So they need supportive adults that help them feel safe 
and that can help calm their stress response. So in a universally designed space, you're gonna to wanna to have a place where they can, they can access to help them calm themselves. Um, this is, we need to identify children's and, fam and family strengths. So universal design does that. What is it the ch child is good at? What are the things that that child and family know about? And how can we tap into those to create meaningful learning experiences for them? The same, it's related to culturally responsive practice, which we're gonna be honoring that diversity instead of seeing it as a problem. And we're gonna be thinking about supporting family preferences and values. And we need to connect more. So kids who've experienced trauma, they need that family partnership more than anyone, but actually all children need that. Um, we children who've experienced trauma absolutely need this, but you can understand that if we're planning for those children, all children benefit from an environment that's predictable, safe and nurturing. And I think it's really cool to point out that all of these best practices link to Wyoming's coherent path to quality, what we shared with you earlier. Um, an important piece that I think is important for all kids is that we want to re reduce transitions. We want to decrease the number of transitions that children who've experienced trauma have to go through in a day. And then we want to be really intentional in how we support them to successfully get through a transition. And you can see that um, when you think about those, th those big three, multiple means to get children engaged and to support them and communicate with them during a transition and for them to successfully show you what they know fits really well with that. Um, another one that this is all, this is all evidence-based stuff here. It sounds cute, but it's just, it's not cute. It's real and true and necessary. They need to engage with open-ended materials because that's how children are able to focus their attention, promote their self-mastery, and it allows them to be able to process their experiences in ways that they cannot do if they're just being asked to sit passively in a space. We also wanna create cozy and calming spaces for children where they can retreat. So it's that same idea that ways that they can help self-regulate, reduce that fight, flight or freeze response. Um, so that those should exist in our classroom spaces. But the thing that's amazing is that might, that might be so essential for a child who's experienced trauma, but it's also a gift for any child in your classroom who needs help with those things. Um, the science says that we need to talk about feelings and emotions so that they can identify those things, the sensations that they're experiencing, connect those to emotions so they can start to recognize those in themselves and others. And then these are big. They need to have their experience normalized and be responded to with unconditional love and acceptance. Um, our focus with those kids needs to be on teaching rather than punishing. So when there's behavior challenges with those children, what we need to think about is that the burden's not on them to change. We need to not go to the most dangerous assumption about them. And instead we need to ask what changes we need to make in our practice. Um, and then these two are our teacher pieces that we just wanna make sure that we have times as teachers to self-reflect and become more self-aware about our responses and then access to systems of support. So um, there's a, Tyler, do you think, could you, could you link to this on the website? I did. I, okay, thank you. You're the best. Um, so that's just like a little sidebar, but I think all of that relates really, really well with that universal design question. So thanks for bringing it up, Karen. And, and I would like to just put a plug in. Um, if you're having any questions about or, or wanting to know more about how play really does help those trauma, those children that have experienced trauma, um, go to the Harvard um, Health Center. Energy. Harvard Center on the Developing Child. It has so many resources of that, that neuroscience that backs why children need to play in order to deal with trauma. It's really cool. Thanks. Um, Tyler, just put that in the chat for everybody. Thanks, Tyler. Anybody have any final questions for us or thoughts you wanna share? Tyler, why don't you just wrap it up for us? Sure, so this was a lot of information to take in and um, we just kind of wanted to share this final thought with you. Uh, just your knowledge and beliefs about your students can greatly impact the trajectory of their learning. Um, and by utilizing universal design for learning with tools like the coherent path to quality um, and backwards design as Shar shared, um, your classroom becomes uh, just a center for success um, for all students. And so we hope that 
um, today's session has you reflecting and thinking about how you can put these things into practice. And please reach out to us if you have any other questions that you think of later um, or want more resources, we'd be happy to provide those. Thanks, Tyler. And here's some of the references that we use today. Uh, yeah, the two places I would be spending time if I had extra time and I was you is that this CAST website and that that Harvard Center website. Those are some incredible resources. So thank you. And thanks, Dina. Ladies, I just want to tell you how, um, how blessed I feel to have you here today. I'm honored that you took time and shared your expertise with us.